Hey, thanks for joining me. Um, this is my Research Ed Norwich presentation on exploring the EEF Metacognition Guidance, A School Journey. And by the EEF, we mean the Education Endowment Foundation. And it's a school journey because this metacognition guidance is something that at my school we've been implementing um, for a few years now. We've put it at the forefront of our thinking about teaching and learning and curriculum. So if you're interested in metacognition and want to learn more, then there's plenty uh, here for classroom teachers in any subject, but also for school leaders as well. And I really also want to sort of unpack that term metacognition um, and what we think it might mean um, and its implications. So um, hopefully something for everybody. Um, so I should introduce myself. I'm Tom Stevens. I'm an assistant head teacher at Long Stratton High School, which is a school in rural Norfolk. Um, we're just down the road from Norwich Research School. Um, I'm my assistant head teacher remit is teaching and learning and curriculum. I'm also an English teacher and I'm an evidence lead in education for Research School Norwich as well. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Please connect with me. Um, I'm always glad to have um, more conversations about education on Twitter too. Uh, so I'll just give some context. Once upon a time, when I look back uh, around six or seven years ago, we as a school had a different approach really to our leadership and to our teaching. Um, it wasn't evidence informed. In fact, it was probably similar to many schools at the time particularly in that we were very focused on key stage four and we were a bit obsessed with interventions. You know, catch up, catch up, catch up, interventions, one-to-one, -one, um, catch up conversations and all sorts. We actually bought into a package called Achievement for All. And I just want to show you this screen grab from Schools Week. Uh, very recently, it really made me think, the EEF published the results of a trial uh, revealing that Achievement for All had a detrimental effect on pupil progress. And I saw this recently and thought, yeah, we used to do that. Uh, admittedly, this trial was key stage two. So perhaps there's a difference between key stage two and key stage four participating in it. Um, but it made me reflect on something that we stopped doing um, because we weren't seeing the outcomes we wanted. And I realized, of course, that it was when we stopped doing this that we also started looking more and more towards research and looking at the evidence. And when we did that, instead, we turned towards uh, the metacognition guidance and this too. This is not the metacognition guidance, but something else that I wanted to share also. The EEF have something they call the implementation guidance. And for us, that has been really useful because it is really worth looking at. It's on their website um, and it's a good challenge to us all as school leaders to move slowly, to explore the problem we have. Um, to prepare when we've decided uh, on our strategy that we are choosing to implement and to make sure that when we deliver and sustain change, we're doing it for the long term, um, that we don't think of any strategy we're implementing as a one-off event. You know those initiative bombs that are dropped in September on an inset day and then perhaps disregarded or forgotten? That's not how we wanted to implement the metacognition guidance at our school. So we were really careful to move slowly and to be ready. So we had realized we were at a point where we needed to think differently about our approach. And we were really interested in the research um, that was emerging from various areas. And we thought we hit upon something that we really wanted to explore. So when it comes to best bets, and I think sometimes that's what we're talking about with research, what, what might be the best bets for teaching and learning and, and for our, our leadership decisions? Um, what might be the holy grail? Um, so what is the holy grail? We were thinking, is there such a thing? Is there a magic bullet? Of course there isn't, but humor me. Uh, drum roll, please. This looks promising, doesn't it? Better cognition and self-regulation. We saw from various sources, particularly the EEF, that this is high impact for very low cost based on extensive evidence. So I'm exaggerating to call this the holy grail of teaching. But actually, when you hear it put like that, it's pretty close, isn't it? It's something to pay attention to. And that's what we did. We recognized that actually, if the evidence suggests this is a good approach to teaching and learning, then we ought to spend some time getting to know the guidance. This is the guidance. I 
thoroughly recommend getting to know it. And hopefully this presentation will do that as well for you, walk you through some of the aspects of the guidance. Um, to my mind, this is one of the uh, best uh, texts to turn to as school leaders and as teachers when we're thinking about how students learn and how we improve their learning. Um, and I think that it is has become something of a uh, touchstone for our school um, leading our, our thinking when we're curriculum planning as well. More on that later. So let's think about what metacognition means. It's a difficult term sometimes. Here's a definition from the guidance itself, Sir Kevin Collins. It's about pupils' ability to monitor, direct and review their learning which would be lovely, wouldn't it, if all students are able to monitor, direct and review their learning. And just to be clear, I don't think of metacognition and neither does the guidance as a form of teaching where the teacher is a guide on the side um, and the students are somehow learning by discovery independently. That's not what we mean by this. Instead, what we're talking about is how do we as teachers and how does our curriculum guide pupils and support pupils um, to be more conscious and reflective in their thinking? The guidance offers this sort of hierarchy of learners. They describe, you know, tacit learners, first of all. Tacit learners are unaware of their knowledge. They don't really think about what they're doing. They just accept, oh, yeah, I, I might know that, I don't know that, and I'm doing this because I've been told to. Learning happens to them. And uh, we might roll our eyes at the thought, but I would put the case that probably we're all tacit learners sometimes, and teenagers perhaps uh, especially uh, likely to be tacit learners um, if we don't give them a nudge and give them the support and give them the right curriculum to help them to be otherwise. Um, and then they might move on to being more aware of their learning, um, maybe finding evidence and generating ideas and perhaps sometimes planning a little bit. Um, and then even better, they might be strategic learners who organize their thinking using problem solving. But here's the, the real holy grail, the reflective learner. Listen to this, reflective learners are not only strategic about their learning, but they also reflect upon their learning whilst it is happening, considering the success or not of any strategies they're using and then revising them as appropriate. Wouldn't you love that to be the case for your students? And I'm not saying that students at Long Stratton High School are always reflective learners. In fact, I would say that nobody is always a reflective learner, but it is something to strive for and something we can become um, when we are working at our best and thinking at our best and learning at our best. That's what we want for our students. So a challenge for you is just to think, what does a reflective learner look like in your subject? The very best example of a student being reflective, what does it look like? Um, and I just want to show you this. This is in the EEF metacognition guidance. And it's this idea that actually, if students are metacognitive, then they plan, they monitor their progress, and they evaluate their progress. This is the cycle of cognition that we need to think about if we want our students to be metacognitive, and also if we want them to progress and be conscious, reflective learners. What does planning, monitoring, and evaluating look like in your subject? How well does your curriculum help students to plan, to monitor, and to evaluate? These are questions that are challenging, and I want to explore them now. So we should probably just go through this summary of recommendations. This is a very uh, nice, handy handout, but on my screen, a lot to take in at once. So I'll go through uh, very quickly um, the seven summary recommendations from the EEF from their guidance. Um, one, teachers should acquire the professional understanding and skills to develop their pupils' metacognitive knowledge. So in terms of that idea of moving slowly um, and thinking about how we implement change, you have to ready your teachers. You have to have the right um, knowledge as staff. 
uh, more on that later. Uh, two, explicitly teach pupils better cognitive strategies, so including how to plan, monitor, and evaluate their learning. But I'll say, in your subject, this can't be done in a one-off assembly. Metacognition is not a form time fix. Metacognition is always something that is different in every subject. And therefore, it needs to be subject teachers and subject specialists who decide on how best in their subject to explicitly teach pupils how to plan and monitor and evaluate. Uh, model your own thinking to help pupils develop their metacognitive and cognitive skills. And this is where I think we need to remember why it's important that we see ourselves as the subject experts and our students as the novices who can learn from us. Um, it's important that we think all the time as teachers about how we model and explicitly um, explain our thinking so that students can learn from us. More on that later. Uh, four, set an appropriate level of challenge to develop pupils' self-regulation and metacognition. I'll say more on that later too. Uh, and five, promote and develop metacognitive talk in the classroom. Six, explicitly teach pupils how to organize and effectively manage their learning independently. And seven, this is a challenge for school leaders again, schools should support teachers to develop their knowledge of these approaches and expect them to be applied appropriately. I love that word appropriately because to me, again, it reminds me of a misconception that's flagged in the EEF guidance uh, about metacognition being something that can be one-off and generic. It can't be, it has to be appropriate to the subject. Um, and schools need to support teachers with that. You can't just have an inset on metacognition and that's it done. Actually, you need subject specialists to be exploring what's appropriate in their subject and what might it look like. So I'm gonna talk through how we've done this and some of the conclusions we've come to and perhaps plant some seeds for you all as teachers and leaders. So the first thing we had to do was to prepare. We had to prepare our teachers, and we had to think about our CPD. At our school, we had been thinking already about cognitive science. We'd started to turn towards research more and more. And we have something we call edu book clubs. Now, just a thought for you. Yes, it's great that we can have um, so much of this online learning at the moment, which is fantastic. And often we might decide to have an, a speaker visit a school um, or a trust. And we might even send people off to listen to the speaker. But I'm just going to say, do not underestimate how much you can get out of a simple uh, version of CPD, which is to have what we call edu book clubs. Um, if you buy a book for eight ninety nine or something like that for your staff, um, and you organise book clubs for them to attend, um, that's really um, a really nice way into the ideas of many of the people that we might otherwise um, see compressed into a, an hour's presentation. Um, so I, I just encourage people to to turn to the books themselves, not just the uh, presentations from those people who have written the books. Um, and I'd just say maybe don't confuse uh, an author's Twitter feed with their book. Read the books. <laughs> so we've decided we'll have well-read staff. Um, and we have, and we've read many books. I particularly recommend these two, um, or at least I would say that these two were a turning point for my thinking about memory and about learning and about some of the um, approaches to understanding cognition. Uh, on top of that, we've uh, include, we made sure that our staff had lots of cognitive science training. Uh, we turned to the research schools network for that. We've sent people on courses with them and we've had um, people come in, including Nikki Kaiser there, um, who have helped with our training too. So what I'm saying here is, don't tell your staff as school leaders, go and do metacognition. Um, in fact, you might even want to forget the word metacognition for a moment and just spend some time making sure that all of your staff know and understand how learning takes place and concepts uh, of cognitive science too. Um, the guidance says it is to have knowledge about how one can learn in a subject without solid subject knowledge. So one of the things we had to also get ready and right 
at the start of implementing this guidance was just making sure that our curriculum across key stage three and four was really using the appropriate um, thinking regarding powerful knowledge and defining the right knowledge that we wanted in, in a good sequence too. Um, setting an appropriate level of challenge was the important first challenge for us. We had been um, looking at our key stage four and our interventions so much that it was time for us to review our key stage three curriculum. And I'm really glad actually, because later on down the line, of course, the new Ofsted framework arrived and suddenly everyone was really interested in their key stage three curriculums, perhaps more than ever before. Um, we were fortunate, I would say, in that the EEF metacognition guidance had really made us think about our level of challenge at key stage three and which knowledge our students were really encountering across that curriculum uh, before it became the latest Ofsted buzzword. So um, that was because of the guidance from the EEF. Um, and it's, it's made us think we really need to have an ethic of excellence. And um, just a little prompt there, Ron Berger's book, if you don't know it, is fantastic on this subject matter. We want to surround our students with excellent work and raise the bar for them. And that's what we've been trying to do. Um, I like this quote from Mary Meyer, we are a challenge seeking species. I, I've seen it widely shared, but it's something that we have in our minds here. If we dumb down our curriculum, we cannot expect our students to then uh, be, become the metacognitive, conscious, reflective learners that we're hoping for. And that's the risk, because actually sometimes I think badly done metacognition or misunderstood metacognitive teaching actually dumbs it down. It becomes something closer to a one-off event um, and some sort of shallow activities to make students reflect. And I'd like to share with you examples of how you might do it better than that. Um, so how you might do it better than that could include this. Uh, and this is a question for you, really. How does the curriculum sequence help or hinder metacognition? How does the curriculum sequence help or hinder metacognition? So in your subject, in your teaching, in your curriculum, is the order of your curriculum appropriate to help students with their understanding and their metacognition. Um, here's a thought, every curriculum construct is on a continuum. I did the assessment leads program with evidence-based education and came across this really great graphic. This idea of there in our teaching being a big idea, a construct that we want students to know and understand, and grasp and remember. Uh, but of course, when we teach it, it has its precursors and its successors, and it will do hopefully in our curriculum, but it might do just in students' minds. They might have some previous experience or understanding or even misconceptions that they're bringing. And then also, where is this leading them to? What are the successors? So a thought here is this. How do we ensure pupils connect it to prior learning when we're teaching whatever that big idea, whatever that curriculum construct, how do we ensure pupils actually see it connected to their prior learning? And how do we help them see beyond to its possibilities? If we don't, um, and it might just be as simple as teachers explaining it to them, teacher explanations are probably one of the strongest things that we have in our teaching toolbox. Um, but if we don't, then they're just at sea. Lessons are one-offs. Um, the uh, subject becomes sort of taught in gobbets and not connected, and therefore it would be to the detriment of metacognition, I think. Uh, so here's an example from uh, our fantastic art teacher, who is Miss Johnson. She's also on Twitter as well, uh, do you find her, uh, at LSHS Art. Um, she begins with this, what are the formal elements? A big question. It's really clear, isn't it? that students are clearly given the signal when they arrive in year seven and begin with this, that actually, I need to know something here. I need to be able to answer this question. And it's clearly giving them the signal that the formal elements are important. And to begin with lessons on drawing and using line 
is really powerful and clearly is giving them a strong indication from the start about the nature of the subject and the nature of what they need first in order to become better artists. And while there may be some aspects of our curriculum like pop art where there are some more experimental um, forms of art, we want our students to always be able to draw and to understand drawing. And so just a question for you, whatever your subject is, what do you begin with and what signal does that give students in terms of your sequence about the nature of your subject and about what they are going to need in order uh, to move forward in their learning? So the next thing is to think about where we want to take them. And we might explain to students what they're working towards, what work they're producing, perhaps what assessment is going to be on the horizon. Um, what we need them to become as specialists in subjects. But even if pupils know where we are taking them, do they know how to get there? And that's a huge question for us if we're thinking about metacognition. What are the pitfalls that they need to avoid? Um, this is a slide from a science teacher in my school, Mr. Moore, who's fantastic. Um, he shares with students regularly their learning in diagrams and graphic organizers, revealing it with a slide like this. Um, and by doing so, hopefully helping them to see connections. Um, and when students arrive in your curriculum at um, the end of a topic or a completed piece of work or at one of your uh, endpoints, do they understand how they got there? Because they may produce a fantastic essay in history, they may complete. Um, a, a wonderful composition in music, but if they don't reflect on how they got there, there might be a learning opportunity missed. And that's another aspect of metacognition. Um, so here's something I really advocate strongly. This phrase is so useful. I deliberately, ask your students to use it. I'd go further actually, I'd really advocate underneath a piece of work when a student is submitting it, ask them first to write down, I deliberately and ask them to really reflect what did they deliberately do when they completed that piece of work. At the end of a lesson, consider asking your class instead of um, perhaps just sampling what they know, what they've learned, or what they've done, um, actually ask them to feed back what did you do deliberately today? That can lead to really interesting discussions. Um, sometimes students will reflect not just on things relating to the subject and the task but on their own behavior. And sometimes we might think about how students are also reflective and planning how they're going to behave and monitoring how they behave and thinking about their behavior for learning too. I deliberately is a really simple, useful uh, two words that I would introduce to your classrooms and, and see uh, where it goes and perhaps consider it for the remote learning at the moment as well. Our students, what did you do deliberately um, how are you tackling the problems at home? Um, see if you can generate those conversations um, from a distance as well. So on that note, exam wrappers are really useful for this. If you're not sure of them, I would suggest uh, researching them. We don't have time to go through all of these now, but um, a nice approach to an assessment uh, we use, for example, in maths for a mock exam wrapper is to ask students to reflect on what they deliberately do for their revision and which things did they spend the most time on and, and getting that feedback um, honestly and having those conversations is another way of reflecting metacognitively. Um, in the guidance there's this, it's, it's in seven steps again but not to be confused with the seven recommendations, these are instead a seven step model for teaching metacognitive strategies. Um, so you might also think about this as an approach to curriculum sequencing um, I like it. One is activating prior knowledge. Two, explicit strategy instruction. Three, modeling of the learned strategy. Four, memorization of the strategy. Five, guided practice. Six, independent practice. And seven, structured reflection. Um, and it's, it's worth having to think about what those things look like in your subject. You might think about which of the seven actually is an area of strength for you if you're a classroom teacher. Um, or you're thinking an area of strength in your curriculum, or perhaps the opposite, you might reflect on um, which of those do you think perhaps uh, you skip or overlook or uh, rush. You might think about which bits of these things are your students best at too. Um, so I, 
on that note then um i just wanted to talk about our homework approach so we actually we, we changed our homework approach a few years back at the same time as this as part of our approach to metacognition um, if i just show that slide again memorization um, is an important part of this um, and activating prior knowledge is important and we've already talked about the importance of having a challenging knowledge rich curriculum to use that phrase um, so we decided that our read and revise homeworks in key stage three would be our approach that's the only thing our students at key stage three are asked to do we give them reading and we give them revision and it's the revision that's relevant to this day which i want to talk about we call them mastery homeworks at first when we moved to this uh we started with this approach so this is what it can look like a knowledge organizer this is one from re and students are challenged to revise the uh, knowledge that we've defined for them and then we will give them re regular low stakes quizzes, retrieval practice in order um, to uh, help their memory of our curriculum. And here's an example of one. And I just like this. Which of the following pictures shows a burqa? And you can see that the RE specialist, Miss Newby, she's a fantastic teacher, has included this. I don't know yet. So we're also asking students to reflect at this point and give honest answers too, because actually, Assessment for learning of this kind, multiple choice questions we found of this kind um, are metacognitive. If they are also low stakes too, they allow students to recognize what they do and do not know and to see where they are on that curriculum continuum and help them to reflect. Um, but there were things that we encountered that were problems. So this is a music knowledge organizer. Um, and I had as a school leader a challenge from some of my um, middle leaders who uh, you know, brought up some really good points and, and really made me think and we needed to reflect and adapt because in music, they were saying to me, this is fine, they are learning things, I'm glad they know it, but I don't, I'm not convinced this is always the best thing for them. So for example, just because a student has learned the definition of Allegro and just because a student has defin um, learned the definition of major and minor and crescendo and so on it doesn't necessarily mean because they've learned those terms that they are any more musical um, that's what we want them to become uh, better musicians uh, have better knowledge and understanding of music and its concepts and so on and i had to really stop and think about what i was hearing here and we're also finding that actually too much of the mastery homeworks in one particular form was tiring and students were having a bit of fatigue. So we redesigned it and our music teachers do ask our students to learn these terms, but they have to apply them. So in music, our students actually have a um, sequenced curriculum of music to listen to um, and apply these terms to for their homework now. And they're hearing music from uh, different composers, genres and periods. So it's actually really supported um, bolstered the curriculum itself as well in other words we're applying it um, and that's making students um, think and remember better we think um, and again art were saying the same thing to me um, this is great that they know certain terms but i don't feel they're necessarily better artists or have better knowledge and understanding of art uh, and similarly in their department to um, in music they have chosen to for their homeworks give students different periods in an art history timeline and different great works of art to look at and to study and apply this subject vocabulary to so uh, just a challenge for people sometimes when we're doing retrieval practice are we sure that students are able to use those terms are we sure that students actually are progressing in their subject be careful of those students who might actually get a full sense of their progress um, because of the um, how well they're doing in low stakes quizzes um, if they can't then apply it um, as you'd like to as subject specialists um, and that reminds me of ollie cavaligoli who's uh, shared uh, allowed me to share this slide so thank you ollie for this um, he once presented this and has shared it in, in various forms including in his really good book on dual coding um, if retrieval practice accidentally leads students to um, knowledge that's organized in their minds as sort of 
random gobbits of information, then that's not as good as if it is in something better. And the list might be better, but even better networks and hierarchies. So in other words, be careful that retrieval practice doesn't lead to um, students having lots of knowledge that is not connected. And that's why you need to design and think carefully about how you approach it. And that's something that we've reflected on. And those are changes that we've had to make during the delivery phase and the sustain phase of our implementation. Um, so I, also alongside that, we've been thinking a lot about how you model your own thinking to help pupils develop their metacognitive and cognitive skills. So some of our staff use visualizers for this, but even just your explanations as teachers. And I've just put this out there, that actually you're the subject experts. So whether you are doing it deliberately or not, you are always modeling what your subject expert, uh, what subject expert in your subject uh, looks, thinks like. Um, therefore, um, how we uh, explain ourselves and our thought processes and make the implicit explicit is, is really important. Um, and we've found when we've been exploring this in our subjects that comparisons are metacognitive. Firstly, students comparing themselves with you is metacognitive. If you're a PE teacher giving a demonstration, students will compare themselves with you. And that is a metacognitive process, which really underlines our responsibility when we are um, giving good teacher explanations and demonstrations, but also their comparisons with each other. In an art classroom, of course, they will see each other's paintings over the shoulder. But in an English classroom, if they never get to see each other's work, it might be very private and they're missing out on that opportunity for comparisons with their peers, which helps them think metacognitively. Likewise, comparing their work, their own work with class models, perhaps another student's work, perhaps you've kept a really good example of a student's work from a previous year, or perhaps if you're comparing their work, asking them to compare their work with a good example, maybe it's an existing example from, for example, a great writer. So in English, maybe you want them to compare their work using a Venn diagram with an example of excellence, wherever that is from, perhaps a newspaper article, perhaps uh, a writer from our literary heritage. Comparisons are metacognitive and Venn diagrams are really simple handouts. I have stacks of them in my classroom. And that's why in our DT curriculum, we were, we've been thinking about this. And one of the things that they have designed is an iterative curriculum at Key Stage 3 and all the way through it's that evaluation. And here's an example of one of the resources they use all the way through Key Stage 3, asking students to compare their own work with um, another product. So their final product and another, um, and another uh, example of a product and comparing the qualities that they have. And they use whole group criticism that critique idea that comes from Ron Berger um, when they're making these comparisons. And we find that is metacognitive too. Comparisons are metacognitive. Where do you use them in your teaching? I would advocate using them um, often and routinely. Um, and likewise, some of these self-reflection sentence starters we found are useful. Um, so you might ask students to try these out, phrases like, I deliberately, so that, a problem I overcame today was, I overcame this by, I have shown progress today by, this work is not yet as good as it could be because, or subject vocabulary I have used today includes. We can't expect students to reflect on their learning without us giving guidance. And we found some of us that these sentence starters are useful. Um, then we've had to think as uh, leaders about how do we possibly evaluate our progress with this? And that is our biggest challenge. It's been really difficult, but the EEF guidance is also helpful because on their website, they include a school audit tool. Uh, this is hard to see here on this screen and there's too much information perhaps, but I would suggest if you're really interested, go and have a look at the website. Um, we've used it as a, a guide. But one of the things we've thought when we've reflected on this audit tool and on the guidance itself is the questions that we ask our students. So when we're in classrooms and when we're seeing students working um, and we're trying to understand our curriculum in each of our subjects, asking good questions of students. 
So when we're trying to evaluate pupils in terms of their metacognition, we're also really essentially evaluating the quality of our curriculum because we might ask questions like these. What does high quality work look like in this subject? What planning strategies do you know to approach this challenge? You might ask a student, what strategies do you know for checking, editing and improving your work? How do you overcome difficulties in this subject or topic? How do you ensure that you remember your learning? And as we've asked these questions of students, some of their feedback has been really interesting. But we've also discovered more generally that as a school, an area we need now when we're in the sustain phase is to help our students be more articulate when they're talking about their learning, but also just generally um, improve the quality of talk in our classrooms and between um, our young people and between um, all, all, everybody in, in our school. So promote and develop metacognitive talk in the classroom is something that we are currently really focusing on as our biggest area, um, uh, uh, biggest area to push um, and develop. So with that, we've turned to Voice21, who is an organisation I really recommend. Have a look at them on Twitter, um, find their website. They published this um, really interesting report, The State of Speaking in Our Schools, which is fascinating, and I, I recommend reading it. And our more recent, one of our more recent Edu Book Club books was this book by Amy Gaunt and Anna Stock from Voice21, Transform Teaching and Learning Through Talk, which is full of some really interesting metacognitive uh, approaches to talk. In fact, you could argue that talk is metacognition allowed. I've heard that said, and I wish I could remember who said it. Um, I can't claim that that's a quote from me. Uh, but here we go. They have these lovely um, resources that we've been turning to, such as the listening ladder and discussion guidelines to make our students also reflect on themselves as listeners and as speakers and to increase their, the quality of their conversation. Um, and that feeds in, of course, to better work, better understanding of their learning, too. It's just hard for us, of course, because we've chosen this year to make this our, um, the aspect that we're scaling up in order to in the implementation of this uh, sustain what we're doing. But the uh, coronavirus context has made oracy a really hard thing to major on. So I'm not certain I can offer the answers right now. We're thinking about this deeply. Um, but how do we make sure that students who are working remotely um, do not suffer terribly in terms of the progress of their oracy? I think that's something that we at schools are doing all the time without realizing it, supporting their oracy. And that's probably one of the things that we are most at risk of losing. Um, so to finally sum up then, um, I, the bottom line is for us, it's this guidance from the EEF is a, a fantastic tool for thinking about teaching and learning and for leadership because it says front and centre, you really need to respect your teachers as the experts, um, recognise them as the subject specialists and support them in their CPD so that they are ready to teach metacognitively. They understand about um, cognitive science and how students learn. It's a really, really useful handout we have here, which is designed by Ollie Cav. Um, that we give to our staff. We actually print on the other side, Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction. And at our school, we don't have a list of non-negotiables for classrooms. Uh, we just hand out this, backed with Rosenshine's Principles on the other side, and ask staff to explore what these things mean in their subjects. That's our approach. Um, so I suppose you might be thinking, well, thanks, Captain Obvious. Um, this just sounds like good teaching and learning. So I'll finish by saying, yes, exactly. And I find so often that that's what the research leads us back to. Things that when we hear the research and the findings of the research actually just give us reassurances as teachers. Forget the gimmicks, forget the um, shiny, expensive uh, intervention packages. Um, good quality teaching and learning is probably very close to what your instincts are as a teacher in the classroom. And it's nice to have that reflected back in guidance such as the EEF Metal Admission Guidance. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope it's been helpful um, and I look forward to hearing from anybody who would like to connect via Twitter. Um, thanks very much for your time.